kind of covering very high level some of the proposed changes that we're talking about right now in the ISO 10993 committee. Um, my name is Thor Rollins, and uh, I've been part of the committee now for about 10 years. Um, but actively, we haven't seen this much discussion and this much change in the ISO 10993 since it's been about three years since we've been <laughs> really changing everything. So that's mostly in respect to what FDA has been kind of looking at, um, some of the concerns they have, and so we are changing um, some of the standards to reflect those concerns. Also from uh, Europe, there's a lot of uh, concerns about animal testing and unnecessary use of animal testing. So we're looking at uh, validating and using in vitro alternatives to those animal tests. So we're kind of going to go through some of those discussions. Um, but I only have a very short time today, so if you have any questions afterwards and want to go to more specifics, I, I love talking about this stuff so we can sit down and, and talk uh, afterwards. Okay, so today we're going to be covering mostly genotoxicity and hemocompatibility. Um, those two categories are the ones right now that we're doing the most work with. Uh, genotox is pretty much set. Uh, we did the final comment review uh, a couple, about a month ago. And uh, we're pretty much set now with a new document that will be released. And we're going to go over what that new document will have in it here in a minute. Um, hemocompatibility, we're still kind of up in the air with. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's moving very, very well. And we're going to probably have some information to you as far as where we're going. But we're still changing that one, so it's not going to be a firm uh, change at this point. We're still discussing it. So genotoxicity, the first thing we want to talk about is kind of the spirit of genotoxicity. For genotox, we have to look at three distinct levels. We have to look at DNA, we have to look at the genes, and then we have to go into the chromosomes, okay? So those three levels are the levels we have to look at through testing. We use four tests to evaluate those three levels. The Ames test, the mouse lymphoma, the chromosome aberration, and then we use an animal test, which is the mouse micronucleus. So we have three in vitro tests, the AIMS, the mouse lymphoma, and chromosome AB, and then the animal test, which is the mouse marker nucleus test. So those four tests are our toolbox, so to speak, to evaluate genotoxicity. So right now, as 10993 stands, we have two options. The first option allows us to do an AIMS test, a mouse lymphoma, and then the chromosome aberration test. So those three in vitro tests can be run according to ISO 10993-3 to evaluate genotoxicity. Now, there's a second option too, which allows us to do AIMS and then the mouse lymphoma, and then we size the mouse lymphoma colonies, okay? By sizing those colonies, we can evaluate the chromosomal damage. So that allows us to replace the chromosome aberration test. Okay, so you have those two options in ISO 10993. Now, as most of you could probably put together, if you had to choose one of those two options, the vast majority of the companies were going to choose AIMS and mouse lymphoma with the sizing, because you eliminate the chromosome aberration test. Well, there was some discuss discussion um, in the ISO and around the FDA about what do those size of the colonies really mean? How do you uh, differentiate between a large and small colony? Well, there was some discussion and some disagreement on that. And the FDA didn't feel confident that the sizing gave you enough information for the chromosomal aberration replacement. So the FDA came out with their own guidance document. And that guidance document says that you have to do the AIMS test, then either the mouse lymphoma or the chromosome aberration. So you choose between the other two in vitros. And then the uh, FDA added the mouse marker nucleus test, which is that animal test, okay? Now before, in the ISO 10993, the only time to do an animal test is a confirmation of a positive. So if you had a positive result in one of the in vitro tests, you can then confirm that positive by going to running the animal test. But the FDA is requiring all medical devices to have the animal test run, along with the names and either the mouse lymphoma or chromosome app, okay? So this is the uh, website, the guidance document from the FDA, just so that you know I'm not lying to you, that I actually have information here. So this is the website that specifies this. Um, another bit of information that we'll get to a little bit later that we might be able to replace the mouse marker nucleus test with some chemical evaluation. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. But as we stand right now, this is the guidance document. The new dash three will actually have this in it. 
we're adopting in the ISO 10993 the idea of doing an AIMS, then either the mouse lymphoma or chromosome AB, and then the mouse marker nucleus. So we're going to have this in the new ISO. As it stands now, we don't, but when it's uh, approved and released, the new ISO will fall in line with the FDA guidance. So that means that even if you're submitting to Europe now, you might not have to do the mouse marker nucleus. But to be com uh, compliant with the new ISO that will be released, the mouse marker nucleus test should be evaluated, um, at least evaluated performing. Okay. So next, we're going to talk about hemocompatibility and what we're going to be doing with hemo uh, hemocompatibility. Once again, in, in ISO 10993-4 we have a toolbox of tests that we can use to evaluate hemocompatibility. Uh, those tests are thrombosis, coagulation, platelets, hemolysis, uh, complement activation. Um, all those tests, you don't have to do all those tests for every device, but those are the toolbox we have to evaluate hemocompatibility. Um, and this is the chart out of ISO 10993-4. Uh, it's table one. And this is chart is supposed to help you evaluate what testing is necessary for your device. So the, the concept behind this is you go down the device examples, you find the example that correlates best with your device, and then it tells you what testing you have to run. Unfortunately, the FDA does not recognize Dash 4. And the reason why they don't recognize Dash 4 is this table. Okay? So this table doesn't really help us out a whole lot as far as what FDA recommends. Now, I do want to kind of hit a couple of tests um, just really fast on how we run them so that you have the information with hemocompatibility. The first one is hemolysis testing. Hemolysis is kind of a cytotoxicity test, but solely looks at the cytotoxicity for red blood cells. Okay? We take your device and we put it in both direct contact and we extract it and put that extract in contact with blood. The whole basis behind this is we want to see how your device interacts with the blood. And the reason why we do both a direct contact with your device and an extraction is because with hemolysis, we need to evaluate both mechanical damage of the hemolysis cells up against your device and then long-term exposure of the device by extracting it uh, using 50 degrees Celsius to see what might come off your device. So by evaluating both the physical properties and the extraction, we can look at both sides of hemolysis. But then we take that device and we put it in contact with blood cells. And then what we want to do is look for how those blood cells interact with your device. Okay? So this right here is an example of our positive and negative controls. On the uh, right side there is our negative, which is polypropylene. And on our left side is our positive, which is uh, um, nitrile gloves. And as you can see in the negative, on the bottom, there's these little red pellets, okay? Those are the red blood cells that when we spin down, they're intact. They haven't broken apart. And so they form those little red pellets on the bottom of the test tubes. On our positive control, those red blood cells have burst open. And when they burst open, they release hemoglobin, which is red. So when they centrifuge down, the solution is red because the hemoglobin's released and mixes with the solution. So now all we have to do is measure how much red is there compared to our controls. The more red, the more hemolysis has taken place. It's a pretty simple test to be able to see how your device interacts with red blood cells. So what we do then is we compare the percentages of hemolysis from your negative control to your device. And then we score them on the grade of non-hemolytic, slightly hemolytic, and hemolytic. The next test we're going to run over very quickly, once again I apologize for the speed of this, but I want to get as much information in as possible, is uh, the complement activation test. And the reason I have this in here is historically the complement activation was only ran on devices with large surface area. And that's like blood filters, um, long tubes, tubing sets, things that contact a lot of blood. And that means that usually, historically, the thought was the more surface area the, you have to have a lot of surface area to react to the complement system. The FDA doesn't agree with this necessarily. And in fact, in the last couple of years, they've been requiring every device that contacts circulating blood to do a complement activation test. Okay? Now, we are reevaluating this right now in Dash 4. There are a couple members of the FDA on the committee that's putting input, and hopefully we'll have a more defined criteria for uh, hemocompatibility. But right now, unfortunately, if you have contact with circulating blood, you're probably going to have to run uh, a complement activation test. 
So for the complement activation, we have to look at two proteins. Those proteins are the C3A and the SC5 beta 9. They represent two pathways, and in fact, here are the pathways, the alternative and the classic pathways for the complement system. Both pathways can activate your complement reaction in your body. So for when we run the test, we have to look for both the C3A and SC5 beta 9 independently of each other to see if it activates any of those pathways. And that's important. Your lab should be evaluating both compounds when you're doing a complement activation. But what we do is we take your sample once again, we put it into plasma, and then we evaluate the complement reaction by looking at turbidity in plates. So it's, it kind of, it's an immune, re immune reaction in the blood, so we look for that immune reaction by measuring turbidity. But it's an important concept to look at. So now what changes are we looking at the 10993-4? The first change, and probably the most useful for you guys, and I'm actually on the subcommittee for this chart, but we're writing a new chart to try to evaluate how, what tests to run for your devices. And this chart will be based on surface area. Okay, so what it kind of looks like is we have the first decision tree will be, does your device a large or small surface area device? And then it goes from there on what testing has to be ran. The discussion right now is what determines a large and small surface area. So that's what's going, kind of going back and forth is, what do we determine a large or small surface area? Once we determine that kind of criteria, then we'll have better discussions on what testing has to be run. But this helps things like stents, and other small devices that might not have to do as much hemocompatibility as they currently do now. Um, the other thing we're looking at right now in the standard is we want to get more detail in the standard as the test procedure itself, especially regarding hemolysis, the test I mentioned before. There are three methods for hemolysis right now that, that labs can follow. There's an ASTM, an NIH, and a Japanese method. The question is, how do those methods compare to one another? If you run an ASTM and a Japanese, do you get the same endpoints for the same device? And that's what we're going to test. Right now, we're starting round robin testing throughout, oh, six or seven labs throughout the world to try to compare the results from NIH, ASTM, and Japan, and human blood versus animal blood. So we want to look at the difference between the methods and the bloods to see if there is a difference, or can we put one single method in the standard that everyone should follow? Okay, so the method looks to have more defined, or the standard looks to have more defined test method and more defined uh, criteria around that method. And then the chart itself. Okay, so the, the last thing that, and I think this might be the most impactful thing coming down, is we looked at in vitro alternatives for biocompatibility. We had great discussions on some testing that's coming down the pipeline for an in vitro sensitization and irritation test. This means that possibly, once we can get it validated, there might be an in vitro alternative to this maximization test and the irritation, the intercutaneous reactivity test. And this is great news because right now the maximization test takes about eight to nine weeks to run. It's a very long test, the sensitization. The in vitro version of that test tend, looks to be shorter. So we might be able to get a, qu a quicker turnaround time for this test and we eliminate the use of animals. Europe has already validated these two methods um, for cosmetics, and we're looking at piggybacking that uh, validation to try to look at we can do an extract from a me medical device. The other thing that we uh, are looking to expand is the extractable leachables, which some of you might already be talking about or doing. But with an extractable leachable plan, uh, first I want to kind of define what the difference between extractables and leachables are. Okay, so a lot of times we just use those words simultaneously. But a leachable is what comes off your device, a chemical compound that will come off your device under normal use. So if it's a tubing set that has saline running through it for you know, eight hours, then what we do is we extract it with water for eight hours and what comes off, that's your leachables. Extractables are anything that can come off your device. So we have to evaluate it at a higher temperature and use a harsher solvent. So at Nelson Labs, we use hexane as our solvent we increase the temperature and the time of exposure to try to get everything off your device that could come off. So your extractables or, the, or your leachables are a subset of your extractables. Okay? But the whole concept is, is to evaluate the chemicals that come off your device and then do an evaluation on those chemicals to see how toxic it might be to a, to a patient. The, one of the 
and this goes to the genotoxicity I talked before, one of the most promising things for me is a way that we might be able to eliminate the mouse marker nucleus test from genotoxicity using the chemical characterization. As you remember before, when we talked about genotoxicity, the mouse marker nucleus was required for any device having genotoxicity for the FDA. There's a chance we might be able to use the chemical uh, leaching off your device to do an evaluation to eliminate the mouse marker nucleus. What that does is we look for things called NOELs. Okay? It stands for No Observed Effect, Adverse Effect Level. What that is is we do your chemical analysis, we take those chemicals and we evaluate each chemical that comes off. And we look for a level that's safe. We look for a level of that using, uh, using different tests that done previously. We look for a level that is safe for that chemical. And then we evaluate the safety of those chemicals compared to toxicity, genotoxicity. The limit that we're looking at doing right now for the ISO 10993 is a threshold of 1.5 micrograms per mil per day. Okay? So what we've done is we've taken the most genotoxic compounds and we look to see what levels those hit. What is it, where's the safety of those levels that could possibly be on a device? And when we put, we've shared some information with the pharmaceutical um, industry and we put a limit at 1.5 micrograms per mil per day. Which means that if you have compounds that are coming off your device that are lower than 1.5 micrograms per mil per day, then we shouldn't have to worry about genotoxicity. So there's potential that we do the chemical analysis, we evaluate how much is there, and if we have less than 1.5 of all the compounds coming off, we can eliminate the mouse micronucleus test from consideration and just do the in vitro tests. That right now is not in the standard, but we're talking about putting that threshold in as a, either a standard itself or as a guidance document, a technical draft. But it'll be a, something that we can do to help eliminate further animal testing if necessary. Okay, so that's the short, quick presentation. Are there any questions that we have to go over? Great, well, I have some information up here um, and in the back. If you guys have any questions, I'll be up here. I'll be more than happy to help. Thank you.